everybody. Welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Dr. Suzanne Loftus. I'm really glad to have with me on the show today, Dr. Paul Danieri, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at the University of California, Riverside. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Thanks for having me. So Paul is an expert in the former Soviet Union, focusing on Ukraine and on Ukraine-Russia relations. Very important for us today. And today I wanted to discuss with him his recent book, one that I have recently read and thought was very useful in understanding the current situation between Russia and Ukraine. And I particularly liked your book because you took a three-pronged approach to it and analyzed you know, tensions between Russia and Ukraine and also between Russia and the West by explaining not only each country's domestic political situation and uh, reasons for acting the way they, they did at the time for domestic reasons, but also the tensions from the post-Soviet era between Russia and Ukraine and how those developed and the tensions between how Russia's relationship with the West developed. So it was a very comprehensive uh, study. And I'd like to ask you, since uh, the book has been published a couple of years ago, there's been obviously some very important developments. Uh, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine earlier this year. And I wanted to ask you, you know, first and foremost, based on the sequence of events that you described uh, so eloquently in your book, did this come as a surprise to you? If so, why? If not, why not? It, it did come as a surprise to me. Um, I would love to say I called this, but I didn't. Um, and I didn't because uh, I thought that, uh, it's two things really. One is I thought it was crazy in terms of Russia's interests. Um, and, and I think in, in, in some extent that part is being proven out. Um, but, but particularly, my feeling was that uh, after 2014 and after the Minsk II agreement in 2015, things were really kind of going Russia's way in the sense that I thought Russia had this strategy. We'll hang on. Eventually, the Europeans will get tired of the sanctions. The sanctions will get lifted. Nord Stream 2 will be completed. We'll have them reined in that much more in terms of gas. So if you assumed or if you believed that... that um, Russia's aims in Ukraine were limited to what it had done in 2014, which is occupying territory, which was sort of freezing Ukraine's um, ability to move further westward and kind of hampering Ukraine's economy and um, eventually working back into good graces with Europe. Things looked to be going Russia's way. All it had to be do was, uh, was, was to be patient. Combine that with the sense that I, like a lot of other people, regarded Putin as smart and ruthless, but as fairly careful about the risks that he took. Um, all that made it seem to me like the smart play for Putin in Russia was going to be to wait out European patients on sanctions um, and slowly but surely put the screws on Ukraine. Um, needless to say, that's not what happened. Yes, exactly. That's why I was surprised. Yeah, it wasn't exactly, uh, you know, uh, rational in the sense of uh, yeah. in his yeah. best interest, uh, which maybe goes to point to more um, kind of effective, rather emotional reasons, mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. fit into the equation. But could you, uh, you know, explain to the audience a little bit, what were the main factors that caused tension in the Russia-Ukraine relationship in the post-Cold War years? Because obviously this war didn't just occur out of nowhere. What, you know, what, what was the, the main issue between the two countries, if you can summarize that? The main issue, um, and as I stress in the book, this goes back to the very beginning of the post-Soviet era in 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. The issue is that Russia um, never accommodated itself to Ukraine's independence, never accepted Ukraine's independence. And they sometimes hedged a little bit about that. And I think a lot of people in the West were a little bit naive in accepting some of the things Russia said at face value, because if you look more than beyond what a few leaders were saying in a few meetings, the vast current of, of what Russians were saying really from the summer of uh, the spring of 1991 onwards, even before the coup was, well, we can do a lot of things and we certainly want to get rid of communism, but Ukraine and Russia have to remain together. And, and that's been constant 
And the only question was, what means are they going to use to, to accomplish that? So that's the, at the core of this is simply that, Russia, uh, Russian leaders, uh, the Russian elite in general, and actually most of Russian public opinion simply hasn't accepted the idea of an independent Ukraine. Then you throw on top of that um, something that's equally been true, I think, since the early 90s, which is that Russia has this conception of itself as a great power. And that's both um, a matter of identity politics, but it's also a matter of sort of more rational realpolitik, which is Russia is and must be regarded as a great power in the traditional sort of pre-World War II sense of great power, meaning um, uh, in particular, they kept on using this sort of formulation, nothing in Europe can be decided without us. And, um, and so that was something that, especially in the 1990s, was vastly at odds with the reality of, of the power that they held, the influence that they had, and particularly the fact that nobody in Europe wanted to be <laughs> governed uh, by rules that were made by Russia. And so the, that's, those are really the, um, the root causes. And the last thing I'll say is, uh, since I study international politics for a living, you know, there's this big school of theory in international politics that says, even if everybody's, uh, you know, even if nobody is aggressive, states naturally come into conflict over their security. And so there's a part of this that I think we should recognize. There's Russia, there's you know, Germany and the other countries in the region. And of course, across an ocean, there's the United States. To some extent, some people would say structurally, the, the structure itself was bound to lead to some sort of conflict, um, regardless of the uh, sort of the revisionist, uh, either the revisionist goals that Russia had, or in a way what you might call as the revisionist goals of the US and the West, namely spreading democracy all over Eastern Europe. Exactly, the uh, structural realist theories and in international yeah. relations for the audience, if you want to. Oh yeah, I don't want to dump too much international relations theory on people, but that's what <laughs> it is. Thank you. Sure. And so how about more looking into Ukraine more specifically? Because, you know, we're talking about Russia not wanting, you know, an independent Ukraine. We're talking about realism and international relations. But what about within Ukraine, the country itself? Are, are you saying that, you know, the entire country wanted to move westward and be independent from Russia? Or are there, you know, more intricate nuances going on or some parts of the country wanted to move westwards and other parts didn't? And how, how was that uh, dynamic in the post-Cold War years until now in Ukraine? This is a really good question because I think there's been a ton of misunderstanding on this. Uh, so let me start with a, with a basic analogy, which is, um, the fact that a lot of people in Ukraine speak Russian doesn't mean they want to be ruled from Moscow any more than the fact that I speak English means I want to be ruled from London, right? Um, or that the Irish want to be ruled from London or anything else. And so that's been a basic misconception. Oh, they speak Russian, don't they? They must, okay. Or anybody in, in all of Latin, uh, Latin America wants to be ruled from Madrid, right? Um, so the language thing, I think, has been hugely misunderstood. Lots of people in Ukraine speak, you speak Russian and want Ukraine to be an independent state. Um, in 1991, they held an independence referendum, and it was free and fair. And across the country, it was uh, in the 80s in terms of the overall vote. It wasn't even close. But in particular, um, in uh, Donetsk Oblast, 78%. In Luhansk Oblast, 78%. In Kharkiv Oblast, 85%. The only places where it was close were, was actually in Crimea, where it was about 54%. Um, so that gives you a sense of the sentiment. Now, to answer the question you really asked, um, so the division in Ukraine is not, do we want to go with Russia? Do we want to go with the West? It was um, between a, a group of some people who felt like um, the, Ukraine wants to go to the West to the exclusion of dealing with Russia, wants to get as far away from Russia as fast as possible, versus those who said, no, it should be both. And that was really the distinction, was especially in Eastern Ukraine, where there were a lot of economic ties, people might have family on both sides of the border, there was this sense of both and. Um, and, and another way of thinking about what happened you know, over the years was partly because of what was happening in Russia and partly about what was happening in, in, West, in, in Europe, um, both and became much harder to pull off. And, and, uh, and, and it became more like a choice has to be made. And, and that's when things got really conflictual. 
Yeah, that's very important to to point out because you know, as you said, there was quite a quite a bit of economic uh, ties uh, mm-hmm. with Russia, and it, you know, and um, Ukraine was you know trying to develop economically as a newly independent state after uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. So many in the East wanted to retain mm, those ties in the interest, you know, of the future of the country. And while others mm-hmm. said, no, it, it's, it is in the interest of our country to get as far away from Russia as possible, as you said. So, you know, this war, this current war, right, it was preceded by, you know, a, a much longer one that uh, began in 2014. And since that initial you know, annexation of Crimea and, uh, you know, incursion into Eastern Ukraine, there were some attempts to sign a peace deal. So the Minsk agreement, they called it. And this agreement would have given a type of autonomy to the Donbass, which was one of the main concerns for Ukraine. So do you think that this was the right solution in the end, given the composition of the population in the area, or was it in fact just a Trojan horse for Russian influence in Ukraine? Uh, I always, I try not to express too sharp opinions on Ukrainian politics um, and what they should do, because you know that's up to them, but now I'm gonna do it, which is <laughs> my feeling was that it was indeed a Trojan horse. Uh, Russia knew exactly what it was doing, and this is why the Ukrainians having signed the agreement, and we should say having signed the agreement uh, at gunpoint. Um, I mean, their forces were being routed in the field when this was sort of laid on the table and told, you know, basically sign it or else. Um, and that, that, but that's why the Ukrainians always resisted uh, um, it, implementing the agreement on Russia's terms. In my opinion, Ukraine would have been better off letting Russia um, seize the territory and an exit than um, then, then, then leaving it in, as, in this fifth column, basically in Ukraine, but controlled by Russia. Um, that that was sort of the, boast, the, 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 the worst of both worlds. And as we think of how we got from 2014 to 2022, one of the um, huge mistakes Russia made in 2014 that I think it took them time to realize what a big mistake it was, was by occupying the Eastern Donbass and Crimea, they took all of the most pro-Russian voters out of Ukrainian elections. And so they accidentally, I think, created a situation where someone like Viktor Yanukovych, who won a free and fair election in 2010, could never, ever come to power in Ukraine. Someone like uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, who's sort of Putin's guy in Ukraine, who Putin clearly was building up to be a a president of of Ukraine. Um, All the voters that are many, I shouldn't say all, but many of the voters that would have voted for him were now in Russian occupied territory. And so it left the sort of democratic option or the infiltration option much less viable um, than than it was before. So from my perspective, um, and I've actually said this for a long time, if you leave the principle aside, the principle that you don't violate others' borders or you don't change borders, Ukraine was actually better off without that territory in in those voters. Mm -hmm. And that's a very controversial thing to say in Ukraine. Although I will tell you that in interviews in Kiev in 2018, when I was working on this book, people sort of said, yeah, we know that, Paul. Um, but nobody's going to say that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so that's the thing. So, you know, what you just said was very, uh, was very interesting. So they're basically, you know, acknowledging that there was this very important population in that part of the country that was, you know, probably getting in the way of really moving to the West and excluding mm-hmm. Russia from Ukraine's orbit completely. So more on that, you know, there's some scholars who have described the events in 2014 as being purely you know, Russian aggression, while others have said, no, actually, there was a component of a civil war. Others have said not quite civil war, but civil conflict. What are your thoughts on, you know, how much of what went down in 2014 was a civil conflict? Yeah, I have some pretty uh, intense debates with some of my friends about this. I I think this is almost entirely, if we want to think about it simply, this is a Russian invasion. Um, And I'll tell you why. Um, And this is based, again, a lot on political science literature on the Civil War, right? There's good research that shows that um, separatist disturbances are a dime a dozen. They happen all over the world all the time, or 
things that could become civil war happen all over the world all the time. The different, the, the thing that makes civil wars is not people pick up guns and try to do something. It's that 99 times out of 100, the government very quickly is able to put them down. Right. So it's not the demand that is, is what needs to be explained here. It's the fact that the Ukrainian government wasn't able to keep it under control. Um, and we know that in the summer of 2014, uh, the Ukrainian government was pretty close right, to driving a wedge between the Donbass and the Luhansk separatists um, and, and was going to defeat that insurgency. And of course, it had been defeated in every other place in Ukraine where it had been tried. So they'd all been stomped out except for these two. They were about to be divided from one another. And then we know what happened. The Russian army rolled in. So there's you can explain some of these outbreaks of uh, oh we're seizing and uh, we're seizing city hall and declaring that we're that we're separating from Ukraine. You can blame that on local separatists if you want. Although I think there's pretty compelling evidence that most of those groups were actually sponsored by uh, um, and, and organized by Russian uh, secret services. I'll put it this way: to the extent that this was a civil war, it would have been over within a few months. I understand. Yeah. So, you know, whatever um, local actual active insurgencies or, you know, rebels were going on, the Ukrainian government could have quickly quelled that. But instead, uh, Russia came in and supported them and therefore, you know, started a much larger violent conflict there. So currently analysts are obviously, as you know, undergoing fierce debate about Russia's intentions as well as how we got here. Many yeah. are arguing that Western, quote unquote, Western concessionary policies yeah. uh, are what emboldened Russia to, mm -hmm. to act. Based on your comprehensive description of events in your book, perhaps this explanation is an oversimplification. What would you think about that? Yeah, I think this is a tough one because of course there are those, there are those who are out there who said, this is all to blame on Western expansionism, right? On NATO expansion. Um, and on and on the West supporting the idea that Ukraine could keep, stay separate from Russia. And then there are those who say the problem is we didn't stand up to Russia sooner. Um, rather than, than necessarily launch an opinion on that, which I do have, what I'll get to is um, how narrow that left the path, the path for Western policy um, and, and, and how narrow that left the path for peace, um, recognizing Ukraine, uh, Russia's position. Right. On the one hand, you know, Russia was doing all these things. I would go all the way back to, to Yugoslavia. Um, Russia was do, you know, basically facilitating Serbian genocide um, in the 1990s. And I think that was the biggest Russian mistake of the era. Russia um, really toxified the U.S. Western, uh, the, the Russia-West relationship over something that really wasn't important to Russia. Um, but, but getting back to the point, um, on the one hand, Russia got very cranky about NATO expansion. But on the other, um, Russia did almost nothing to uh, relieve the fear that the Central European states had um, for their security. Um, and that again goes all the way back to the early years of, it's already in, in December, 1993 that Yeltsin has used tanks to disperse uh, the Russian parliament and he's written a new constitution and brand new elections, this guy called Vladimir Zhirinovsky who just died a few weeks ago. Zhirinovsky, right, his party wins the elections, and he's talking about restoring the Soviet empire. Um, and so what were you going to do in that circumstance if you were the West? It was, it was hard to stand up to Russia without alienating Russia. And again, this gets back to the idea of the security dilemma. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I wanted that, you know, my following question was going to be more on NATO enlargement and NATO expansion, but just to clarify a little bit more on, you know, concessionary policies. Yep. For example, now, you know, there's a lot of uh, blame on Germany, for example, yep. for, or, um, or France, you know, for, yep. for stopping uh, NATO enlargement to Ukraine in 2008, and also for continuing to buy so much Russian gas and for just appeasing Putin all yep. these years. And while you said, you know, of course, there's another camp that says that we did exactly the opposite, which I want to get into afterwards. Yep. Okay. But right now, in terms of this concessionary, these concessionary policies, um, can we blame Germany and France right now? Better if Germany and France have their own accounting. Um, 
they don't always they don't always love it when Americans heap blame on them. But but to answer your question, yes, they they um they they made a calculation, right? And the calculation was, and it was again not an unreasonable calculation, but the calculation, at least on the surface, was there's no European security without Russia being happy. And so they okay, we got to keep Russia happy. That makes sense up to a point, right? Up until the point you're dealing with a Russia that can only be made happy uh, on terms that are utterly unacceptable to the West. And it's only in 22, 2022 that I think the Germans and to some extent the French have finally come to realize that that's the case. Um, but the Germans, uh, um, you know, they bet on this sort of, what was it called, you know, uh, Vandal durch Handel, uh, sort of, you know, peace through trade. Um, it didn't work, it failed. But there's another level of this, which gets back into German domestic politics. The Russian government essentially bought a German chancellor, right? And I'm not sure Germany has really come to grips with this either, right? And I'm talking about Gerhard Schröder and the fact that one month he was the chancellor of Germany signing big uh, gas deals with Russia. And, and, the, and a few months later, he's not the chancellor anymore. And he's on the payroll of Gazprom or of this uh, Nord Stream consortium making millions or probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, it, it, so there's the, the international level at which Germany and France kind of bet on trade solving the problem. But there was also this domestic level at which uh, the German government was essentially corrupted by, by Russian money. Um, and, and, and of course, much of this has happened in London as well, and, and not a, a, a tiny amount in Washington either. Um, big Russian state-owned firms spreading money through Washington lobbying firms. Um, all through the 90s and the and the the first decade of this century. And there's also, you know, a lot of blame now just simply on Putin, the man himself, yep. and that, you know, this is all his doing and that no yep. one else, you know, would have done that if, you know, there had been another leader in power. And I want to ask you your opinion on that. Is it really that he has this, you know, strange obsession with Ukraine and he's the only one that that shares these views or is this you know a sentiment that's shared across the board in in Russia and it, particularly among the Russian elite the sentiment is very widely shared um you know something that people ignored for a long time but i've seen it quoted maybe five times in newspaper articles in the last week is this famous old quote from the the, the Russian dissident poet Brodsky, Joseph Brodsky right who won the nobel prize and was a basically was, was uh, an emigre in the United States for a long time, who, who basically, you know, at the time of the, that Ukraine became independent in 1991, just heaped scorn on the notion of Ukrainians and Ukrainian independence. The point I'm getting at is that even Russian dissidents living in the United States um, tended to think the idea of Ukrainian independence was absurdity. So in that sense, this is very widely held and why I've said for a long time, the idea that when Putin dies eventually, which he must, um, that all this will be taken care of, I think is naive. Um, that being said, when we think about sort of the period from 2014 to 2022, and particularly this invasion um, that started in February, 2022, I think more and more of trying to understand it is going to come down to understanding Putin. Um, I think in a, in a large sense, the Russian uh, society supports the idea of regaining control of Ukraine, that doesn't mean they would all have done this. And I think with this, at this point, it's merely speculation. Um, why did Putin feel a sense of urgency in 2022 that made something so catastrophic seem like a good idea? Um, and, and again, we can speculate about how much reading he's been doing and what he's been reading and who he's been listening to during lockdown, the effects of isolation during lockdown, maybe the fact that he turned 70 this year and he begins to think I don't have forever to accomplish this. There are all these things. Um, but I, I don't think we can safely say that any Russian leader would have launched this war. Right, yeah, I mean, the war, the, the decision to launch the war, you know, was a very particular one. But as you said, you know, sentiments about Ukraine are, you know, are very common among the elite and having, you know, uh, at least leverage over the country is shared among Russians. So finally, I also wanted to discuss, as you you know briefly touched on, um, you know the role of NATO enlargement and uh, the West's uh, actions in the last couple of decades. So 
Would you briefly explain, if it's even possible, the history of Russian-Western relations uh, and what exacerbated their relationship? And how much do you think Putin's motivations in Ukraine are truly about questions on NATO enlargement and EU enlargement? Uh, because, you know, sometimes when we mention the argument that NATO expansion was aggressive, you know, we're, we're accused of, of spreading Russian propaganda. So what are your yep. thoughts on all that? Yeah, I think um, it's hard to answer briefly. You've asked a big question, but um, The, the, the conflict we now have is a, is a mixture of Russia wanting Ukraine back and Russia being so resentful, and Putin in particular, I think, being resentful to the point of fury at the West for the way he feels that he and Russia have been treated by the West. Um, so it's, 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 they're both contributing factors. And, and I guess the way I would put it is like this, is if the relationship between Russia and the West were better, Putin's desire to seize Ukraine might have might have had a better uh, we might have had a better chance of, of moderating that somehow. Um, but instead, it went in the other direction. He saw it like not only do I get Ukraine, but I'm sticking my thumb in the, the eye of the West and standing up to the West. Uh, and the roots of that, I think, are, are very, very deep. Putin came up through the KGB. So before the Cold War is even over, right, he's got a view of the West and of the United States. Um, he is part of that group of the Russian elite, which again, I'm going to say is much, if not most of the Russian elite, who from the very beginning regarded the collapse of the Soviet Union as a catastrophe, right? He's that famous line, he gets quoted over and over again, um, you know, with the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Um, the thing he said after that, people, people focus on less, which is equally interesting because he said, um, he said uh, you know, anybody who, who, who thinks they're going to put it back together has no head. Um, but apparently he's fallen into that category. Um, so there was Yugoslavia and this sense that Russia had been ignored over Yugoslavia and that a traditional Orthodox ally had been beaten up by the West because Russia didn't stand up for it. And that got Russian nationalism going. Then there was liberalization in Russia in general. Um, then there was the financial collapse of, of 1998, which was seen as this is what we get for, for doing what the West says. <clears throat> Then there was Kosovo in 1999 that uh, in particular infuriated um, Putin um, and Putin's, the way that Russia responded at that time should have been one of those signs, right, in the West that this, the, the, that this is not the guy we want him to be, right? Um, there were all these kind of signs that we, we didn't so much miss, but we ignored them because the consequences of accepting them were too painful for us, which is, holy smokes, we're going to have to confront Russia. Nobody was ready to do that. Um, then there was Iraq. So there were just these series of things that happened that just absolutely um, irritated Russia, got Putin feeling like, and a lot of other people around the world, like the United States talks about these rules until they don't like them. And I think this just stoked and stoked and stoked his fury. Now, I want to be absolutely clear. While I think there's a separate conversation to be had about the wisdom of US foreign policy since 1991, none of this justifies, nor does it explain um, what Russia has done. But I do think we should recognize that that is how they saw those actions, right or wrong. Um, doesn't justify Russia uh, attacking its neighbors. But what it did was it made it harder for the United States to have influence and for the West in general to have influence over um, Russia. Um, and Putin, given who Putin was, it made Putin over time increasingly, I think, um, we're gonna take our time, we're gonna rebuild our power, and, and then we're gonna play a different game. And that's what he's done. Um, it, I don't think it's the West's fault that Putin is resentful, but Putin is very resentful. Indeed, and this brings us back also to the uh, structural realist argument here that even though the West may not have viewed it that way, Putin certainly did, uh, certainly viewed NATO enlargement and EU enlargement to the East as being aggressive. Uh, that's right. I mean, and one of the things I think is, I think originally, you know, early on, he said some things about NATO expansion that were very uh, lukewarm. He was like, you know, it's, it's, it's up to those states. Um, 
I think as he got angry about other things, he got angry about NATO expansion retrospectively. And I do think one of the things that has may have happened also with all of this rhetoric about Ukraine has been part of Russia since 988 when Volodymyr the Great, you know, baptized the Kievans. I think this is stuff that when he started saying it was propaganda, and he said it so many times now that he's really started believing it. And I think in a way that's true about all these resentments about the West, is originally these were rhetorical points, and now he's, he's really internalized them. I do want to say about NATO enlargement, um, we don't know what would have happened if NATO had not enlarged. But, I, but at least I, we at least have to think about that um, when we criticize NATO enlargement. Would Poland be the democracy, flawed as it is, would Poland be democratic? Would Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia be these models of democracy? Would Czech Republic be as fantastic, as amazing a place as it is? These were places in the early 90s that were not only shaky in terms of their safety from the Soviets who had, or from the Russians who had just occupied them for 50 years, um, but democracy in those countries was very much in the balance. And NATO uh, enlargement was initially as much about consolidating democracy in Eastern Europe um, as it was about expanding geopolitical influence because, um, because EU expansion is so complicated that it just couldn't happen very fast. So the quick thing you could do was bring them into NATO and use that process to consolidate democracy. That was a smashing success. And had Russia remained even modestly committed to democracy, that would have seemed like a good thing to Russia, not a bad thing. And so I think the other underlying story here is is that um, what I would put it this way, once Russia becomes autocratic, right, um, then somewhere in Europe, there's going to be a line between the autocratic part of Europe and the democratic part of Europe. That was going to be conflictual no matter what. The only question is, where's the line going to be? And in a way, that's still what we're fighting about now is where's the line going to be between autocratic Europe and democratic Europe? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, you know, no one knows how this war is going to end or if it ever will. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, if maybe you had a couple of insights on how you think this is going to unfold. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably better, uh, more expert on political things than on military things. And uh, but I know enough to know that uh, predicting how wars will go um, is a sucker's game. So um, having said that, I will now predict how the war is going to go. Um, <laughs> Because we have to, right? You have to generate expectations. You also have to be aware that you can't count on them too much. As we know, we all, almost everybody thought the Ukrainian regular army was going to be defeated quickly. Um, I thought we would be into insurgency phase by now, and we're not. Um, as what it is now, in my uh, estimation, right? This is now a battle of logistical support. Um, how how can Russia supply its troops with everything from fuel to artillery shells? How long does that last and how long does their morale last um, versus how long does the West continue to supply Ukraine? So it's about logistical support, material support, and it's about morale to fight. Um, I see this dragging on for a long time. Um, I don't see, I hope that, and I, but I actually think this is right. I shouldn't just say hope. I don't see Russia being able to have that gigantic breakthrough um, that's going to encircle you know, Ukrainian armies, World War II style, and, and once again, allow them to take Kiev. Uh, nor do I think it's very likely that the Ukrainians are going to be able to amass enough force to push the Russians out of Ukraine. And so the question is whether it's three months from now or six months from now or two years from now, do they sit down, are they able to sit down and negotiate some kind of ceasefire and peace treaty? Um, or does this sort of become semi-frozen like it was for the last eight years, right? That conflict, I don't think anybody thought in, 19, in uh, 2014 that we would be where we were in 2021, right? Um, I don't think anybody thinks now that this still might be dragging on in whatever eight years from now is, seven years from now, um, but that's a possibility. Uh, so it's either that or, there, or, or both sides are gonna have to swallow some really bitter pills in a peace negotiation. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your insights. That was a, a great uh, last uh, 35 or so minutes. Uh, I really appreciate you being with, uh, with us here today on our podcast. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And to the audience, as usual, thank you so much for tuning back in to Security in the 21st Century.